this evening. It's actually songs of Solomon. There are a lot of songs. But this is one special song that he chose. And that God chose to put into the Bible. So this, this is a song that is the best of all his songs. And I'm sure there are a lot of other songs that he had wrote. Uh, a great wise man. Very talented. Like his father David who loved to worship the Lord. Uh, and so I'm sure that there were other psalms. And so songs of Solomon... What we see in the psalm is Christ and the church, and I'll explain that in a minute. Let me give you an introduction be- before we get into chapters 1 through 4. <clears throat> I believe that Ephesians is correct in chapter 5, verse 32, when it says that, that marriage is a mystery and that it reflects Christ in the church. There's something there that, that is... A mystery in the sense of our relationship with one another as, as couples, as individuals, coming, uniting, becoming one, somehow reflects the relationship of Jesus Christ, who is our Savior and King, who died for the church and then will be wed in heaven with the church for eternity. You see, we came into this earth as single, and when we leave this earth, we will leave as singles, because in heaven there is no marriage. Remember the parable that was told uh, by Jesus to the religious leaders who asked about, you know, uh, a woman having seven husbands and one died and then married the next and who's going to be her husband in, in heaven? And of course they thought that, that uh, they trapped him and he had no answer. And Jesus said, there is no mar- marriage in heaven for we'll be married to God in heaven. So we came into this earth single and when we're in this earth, we're married. Why is that? And then when we leave this earth, we're not married. So why is that? Because God has a purpose with it. God wants to reflect His Son Christ in the church. And so marriage is a reflection of Christ in the church. We reflect that in our relationship with one another to the world. We could have a great responsibility and a great opportunity in our relationships with our spouses to reflect Christ to the world so that they can see Jesus Christ in the church. And and what a springboard to be able to share with others when they ask you, why is your marriage so good? And we can say, because we reflect Christ in the church. And when you come to Christ, it's wonderful. It's great. It's awesome to have a relationship with God. And so in this Song of Solomon, we see such a great love story allegorically. And I'll explain that in a minute of Christ and the church. Obviously, it's a love story. It's a poem. It's about love between a couple, Solomon and his wife or fiance and wife-to-be. And he writes this beautiful love song to her. It is intended to be sung to her. And I can't wait to get to heaven and, and hear the song really being sung the way that it should be sung. I don't know how it would sound today, and I don't think anyone does. Uh, we can probably guess and maybe put some chords to it. I don't, I don't know, and I haven't heard of anyone doing anything like that, but what a beautiful song it would be if it was literally sung. We know the author to be Solomon, written about 970 B.C. before Christ during his reign sometime. It is a story of a bridegroom who is in love with his bride. A beautiful story. A love story. And... It is a reflection of Christ in the church, but a reflection of a groom's love for his bride. In this psalm, we have some great details concerning that love for his wife. We have intimacy that is very deep. In fact, the the Jewish people uh, often said that it's not a book that we allow our children to read because there's such a deep, intimate relationship between Solomon and his wife that it's too sensual for the kids to read until they get older. And so we're not going to go down that path, though as you read it, you can get the innuendos by the Holy Spirit. And obviously the Holy Spirit has written this book uh, for us so that we can understand what true love is. I know personally the intimacies of love, because I love my wife. 
I met her, and I don't suggest that, that we do this or allow our children to do this, but I met my wife at the age of 13, and I fell in love. I mean, I was in love. Now, at the time, I would have all my aunts or uncles and friends, oh, this is puppy love, you'll break up, you'll find someone else, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I says, no, this is the one for me. I was totally in love. And we did break up. Right out of junior high, we broke up. And then in ninth grade, around Christmas, I asked her to go, or actually, I asked her to go to the formal, high school formal, and she said no because she was going with one of my friends and I got so upset that he would even ask her knowing that I had been dating her in junior high, but he did and they went and right immediately after I went after her, you know, and uh, we started dating at that time. And I was in love with her, deeply in love with her. I mean, I would dream about her. I couldn't get her off of my mind. I would, I would write love letters to her. And I don't write very well now. And I wrote really bad back then. And she still has some of those letters to this day. You know, and that love never diminished whatsoever. In fact, it just continues to grow and grow and grow. Because I just, I, I love her to death. You know, and I can stand here and say that if she were to go before me, I would be devastated. I, I don't know what would happen to me. I don't know what I would do. And I often joke with people, I'd probably have to get married really quick because I can't be alone. I don't know what it's like to be alone. I've known her since thir she was 13, and I was 12, actually. You know, and we had our first child at the age of 15, 16, um, and then four boys afterwards. And we have been in our ups and downs, but, you know, I love her to death. And I would even venture to say, and she would probably agree with you, that I, that I love her more than she loves me. You know, uh, because, I don't know, I, I'd even, she'd even say, he, he possesses me. You know, and that's how much that I love her. And she's a part of me. And if she were to go, I, I would be devastated for it. So I understand Solomon's perspective when he describes these beautiful thoughts pertaining to his wife. I mean, just amazing how deep love can really go. And yet that love is a reflection of Christ and the church. And, and I think that we need to understand that mystery uh, of, in our own relationships when we deal with one another. It's a great responsibility and it's a great opportunity to reflect that to those around us. So the purpose of the Song of Songs is another uh, way of putting these books is to give us also a picture of God and his love for his children. And so in the Old Testament, because they worship Jehovah God, God wrote this song through Solomon to reflect his love for them. And of course, allegorically, uh, we use it to reflect Christ and the church. Now, allegorically basically means that we draw pictures out of it. And we do have to be careful. And there's been other pictures drawn from this too that we need to be careful. Anytime you, you, you start looking at scriptures as typologies, you have to be very careful. You can't be dogmatic about it. Yeah, it might be a picture of, but be careful that you're not making it into a doctrine and then it's absolute truth. Because we don't know. It's our opinion and we can see it there. John Corson is the master of it. He has so many allegories for a lot of things. You just go, wow, how did he get that? You know, And some of them just blow you out of the water that like, I, I just don't see that completely uh, at all in that scripture. But... You know, we can pull these allegories out, but we have to be careful not to dogmatically say that it's truth. We know that this is a, a, a written song from Solomon to his wife. That's the truth. You know, and he describes this love to her. And we can draw from that God's love for his people, Jesus' love for the church, or even our love for our wives, in a sense, too. In these chapters, uh, we'll break it up into three sections. Tonight, we'll look at Chapters 1 and 2 and 3 and 4. 1 and 2, Solomon writes of the courtship or his engagement to his beloved or to his lover, as, as he calls her many times. You know, in our relationships, we have those type of relationships. My wife is my wife. She's the mother of our children. But she's also my friend. And I have this friendship with her, but she's also my lover. And I have an intimacy with her that nobody else has. And we have these different types of relationships with our spouses that we're to have and that are healthy and that are productive you know, in this world with our spouses. 
And then chapters 3 and 4, we read of the marriage ceremony taking place. And we all remember marriage ceremonies. Those of you that are married or you've been to a ceremony, it's probably one of the greatest events in our lives. You know, we have so many different events in our lives. The birth is, is probably one of the greatest, to, to have your children born into this world. Uh, every one of my children were born naturally. Modesto was born in the um, normal way as, as far as an operating room. I don't know if they just call it a birth room, but it had all the, the sterile things, and so it wasn't as, as intimate, but I could remember that day, and it was like at that time there was a movie uh, that was out uh, about the African-American slavery, and uh, there was a scene where Kuta Kente got his son, and he raised him up in the set, and he named his son, you know, and that's how I felt. I wanted to grab him and lift him up, and this is my son, you know, type of thing. And then, and then afterwards, um, we had Simon, and then Moses, and Roman, and they were all in what we called the ABC room. It was basically just a bedroom, uh, a bed with furniture, and we went in there and had the children. Actually, a great event. I recommend for all fathers to be there as their children are born. It is a beautiful thing that takes place, place and you remember for the rest of your life. And of course, the other thing is, is graduation, right? When you get them graduated, you know, and they, they're graduated. Yes, they made it through school. They got their degree. You know, that's another great, great event, you know. And then the next is, is their wedding, you know, that day that they get wed. You know, and then probably the last greatest event is when they go from this earth to to the next you know of course grandchildren and squeezed in there too but that great event when we are graduating from this world to the god's world his kingdom so we all seen uh, beautiful weddings that have taken place and then five through eight we'll see next week the relationship between a husband and wife and the power of their of their love so let's look at chapters 1 and 2, the courtship and engagement. The song of songs, which is Solomon. So he picks the best one. The Shulamite. Now the Shulamite is the young girl who is singing here. This is Solomon's uh, fiance, wife to be and will be as we get through uh, this song. She sings this in a sense to Solomon or to whoever, whatever audience that they're singing it to. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. So it gets pretty detailed, you know, as we go through this. For your love is better than wine. Wine's intoxicating. Wine gets you tipsy. So her kisses to her husband are intoxicating. And they should be. Because of the fragrance of your good ointment, your name is ointment poured forth. Therefore, the virgins, that is the other maidens in the land, love you also. Draw me away. Uh, the daughters of Jerusalem, we will run after you. The Shulamite then says, the king has brought me into his chambers. Our love relationship with Jesus must, must never become stagnant. We have to keep it fresh, just like in this relationship. It's fresh. You know, to, to kiss your spouse and it be just as exciting as when the first time you kissed. Knowing Jesus Christ, and it should be to this day after 25 years, is just as exciting to know Jesus Christ. I can remember being a young believer and listening to these older pastors, and they would talk about, oh God, your grace is just so good, and to just, just experience your mercies. And I'm just saying, wow, I'm just experiencing that. Here they are 50 years later, and they're still talking about God's grace. How do they keep that zeal? Because we realize what sinners we are. And how much we fail God and how much he never fails us. And so his grace and his mercies are always good. And so we can't get stagnant. You can't allow yourself to get stagnant in your relationship with Christ. Neither in your relationship with one another. Though it may happen in our relationship here on this earth, but it shouldn't with the Lord. He wants to lead you into a deeper intimacy. An experience where, where it's you and him in his chambers in a sense. You know, going to the closet and just having an intimacy with God. That's hard to explain to someone that has not had that intimacy, but God wants you to have that intimacy. You may have to get away by yourself and go to the mountains. You may have to go and lock yourself in the room. You may have to go in the middle of the night outside where it's dark and no one's out there and lay a blanket and just start talking to the Lord and saying, Lord, I want your intimacy. I want you to fall on me. 
I want to be close to you. I want to sense and I want to smell your breath, Lord, on me. And it's a, it's a matter of seeking him with your heart, with your mind, with your soul, and a desire to know God. And when you do that, the Bible says that if you seek me, you will find me. And God promises that. And, and when you do it and are committed to do it in that manner, it's amazing what God will reveal to you. I mean, he will pour himself out upon you. But why doesn't he do it now? Because you need to seek Him. He wants you to seek after Him. He wants you to spend the time with Him. He doesn't want to just pour it out on you and then you take advantage of it or you receive it you know, without really understanding the importance of it all or the commitment of it all. He wants to pour His whole life into you and He has so much to pour into you but it only comes in those intimate times. <coughs> the day that I received the gift of tongues. I mean, I was just asking the Lord, Lord, I want that gift. And it took me, I would say, a good six months seeking that gift. Six months, just, Lord, where's the gift? I want that gift. And I was praying and seeking it. Day after day, Lord, I'm still waiting for the gift. And one day I was on my way to Dave Rosales' church at the time, and I'm just like raising my hands, Lord, I just want the gift. I just praise you. I glorify you. And then all of a sudden these words came out of my mouth. And I stopped, like, what was that? And I just, okay, Lord, is that the gift? I, I wasn't sure. You know, I, I just was trusting Him, started praising Him again, and boom, they came out. And I ended up speaking in tongues, didn't go to Dave Rosales, just sat in the parking lot, just speaking in tongues the whole time with the Lord. We have to seek the Lord, though, in those chambers. And He will give us things that we'll be blown away with. You know, when I accepted the Lord, I, I read through the Scriptures, and I said to myself, if this is true... And I'm going to experience a lot of neat things. I'm going to experience healings, you know, gifts. I'm going to see miracles and signs and wonders. I'm going to see people coming to... I'm just, I'm going to, if this is true, I'm going to experience that. You have to experience it. And I did. All of it. I've seen miracles. I've prayed for miracles. And not believing, yet God gave us miracles. It gave us healings, you know, and gifts and various things. But my point is, and I know I'm, I'm really knocking this in is you have to seek Him and want those things. If you don't, then He's not going to push them on you. Now the daughters of Jerusalem sing, We will be glad and rejoice in you. We will remember your love more than wine. And then she says, Rightly do they love you. I am dark but lovely, O daughter of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Do not look upon me because I am dark, because the sun has tanned me. So some have suggested, well, she must be an Ethiopian, an African American, I was say African American, an African from Ethiopia at that time, but no, she's actually because she's tanned. So she was at the beach. She's a surfer girl. <laughs> now she was just very dark skinned, lived in the desert, you know, the sun was always on her, and so it wasn't that she was a different nationality, she was just dark complexion. My mother's sons, that is her stepbrothers, were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyards I have not kept. In other words, what she's saying here is my, my dark tan, you know, don't look upon me because I'm dark, so forth. My brothers were angry because uh, I kept the vineyards, but yet I didn't keep myself up. And so she didn't care about herself, but yet she was so beautiful. She was so beautiful, but her focus was not on self. It was on others. Now the brother, to her brother, she says, Tell me, O you whom I love, where you feed your flock, where you make it rest at noon. Why, for why should I be as one who veils herself by the flocks of your companions? So this is her first part of the song as she's singing it. Now Solomon comes in in verse 8. Uh, if you do not know, O Ferris among women... So you see that, that drawing that he has. You're the most beautiful of all women. This is how he views her. Follow in the steps of the flock and feed your little goats beside the shepherd tents. I have compared you, my love, to my filly among Pharaoh's chariots. Now he's comparing to a horse. <laughs> your, your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with chains of gold. That's his part. And, and now... The song's a little strange because it's taking their culture at their time and what they valued like fillies, you know, and deers. And so they use those animals to kind of express their, their 
details of love for the other person. And so you'll find some humorous things for us today, but I'm sure that it was very serious for them. Now the virgins respond, that is the daughters there in Jerusalem, we will make you ornaments of gold with studs of silver. I, I like that, how, how the other ladies always get involved. You know, when someone's in love, when there's going to be a wedding on all the other ladies, come in, let's do this, let's try this, let's do this hairdo. You know, and they start helping out. Every time I do a, a wedding, there's always at least three or four other girls that are, are helping the, the, uh, the bride out, you know, to prepare herself for the groom. And um, it's beautiful. Now she, she says, while the king is at his table, my spikenard sends forth its fragrant fragrance. A bundle of myrrh in my beloved to me that lies all night between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blooms in the vineyard of Engedi. And then he says, Behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. You have a dove's eyes. Now, yeah, so they're very wide, big eyed. Uh, and they're beautiful in his sight. Beauty is in, it, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, isn't it? And he's in love with her. Behold, you are handsome, my beloved. Yes, pleasant. Also, your bed is green. The beans of your house are cedar and your raf- rafters of fur. So, you, you see this song going back and forth between him and her. Of this intimacy that they have with one another. Personally, I think it should be that way. When was the last time that you, you told your wife that she was the best filly you had? <laughs> you know, when was the last time you told your husband, you know, uh, some few things here and there? We need to do those things to keep our relationships alive. Um, know this, that Jesus looks at you with open eyes, that he wants to court with you and that he wants to be intimate with you in every which way. He wants to literally be your husbands. He wants to be your wives. Uh, he wants to be your everything in his life. He really does, more than we can imagine. If, if this is a picture of Christ in the church, and we understand it in our relationship, how much more does God love us than what we really know? I, I think we just hit the tip of the iceberg on how much he really loves us and cares for us. It's just amazing. He goes on in chapter 2, I am the rose of Sharon and the lilies of the valley. And then she says, like a lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. There's some jealousy there, I guess, among the daughters in that area. And she goes on, like an apple tree among the trees of the woods, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down in his shade with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banquet, banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Sustain me with cakes of raisin, refresh me with apples, for I am lovesick. This left hand is under my head, or his left hand is under my head, and his right hand embraces me. A lovesick. Yeah, that's when you're in love. <laughs> I mean, his, his tender expressions of love for her. Jesus has those type of things. He says, you're the apple of his eye. His focus is always on you. His mercies are great towards you every morning. You know, the graces are there being poured out. He has nothing but best intentions for you and hopes for you. And he's tender in mercies towards you. He goes on, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the does of the field, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. And then she says, the voice of my beloved, behold, he comes leaping upon the mountain, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, he stands behind our wall. He is looking through the windows, gazing through the lattice. My beloved spoke and said to me, rise up, my love, my fair, fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle doves is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth green, uh, her green figs, and the vine with the tender grapes gives good smell. Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. 
O my dove, in the cliffs of the rock, in the secret places of the cliff, let me see your face, let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Then his brothers or her brothers say, Catch us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. Then she says, My beloved is mine and I am his. He feeds his flock among the lilies until the day breaks and the shadows flee away. Turn, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag upon the mountain of the air. That courtship, that intimacy. I had a friend that, um, I think I shared this, but maybe you didn't hear this story. It's worth repeating. When you're in love, the things that you'll do. He met this uh, girl that was engaged and she was going to be married rather soon. And so he wanted to steal her away. And so he, he thought about it and he actually set up a time where, where he could um, serenade her. He had a friend that played the guitar. They came up and they picked a song out in Spanish because she was Hispanic and spoke Spanish. And he went to her house and the friend was in the bushes with the guitar playing it. And he started singing to her in the window. She opened up, saw him, and he went through the whole song. He practiced for months the song in Spanish, sung to her, and won her heart. And they got married. And then he, in the wedding, he wanted to really impress her. So he learned a, a, a uh, and I don't know the, the words for it, but a, is it a florico? Um, dance that men do and so he took months in learning the dance and then he danced around her while she was in the, in the center of the of the place and danced around there the whole thing because he was just totally in love with her and he did all that because of, of the love that he had for her so you know again love sick when you get love sick you know oftentimes when I counsel people tell me well I don't love him anymore or I don't love her anymore and that's sad that we allow the enemy to lie to us in that way because that is a lie of the enemy when you marry someone it's for life it's forever it's until death do you part you know and you have to do whatever it takes to rekindle that love you know if it means going to counseling then go to counseling if it means um for you to to start back and remember what you were doing when you first met, then you need to start doing that. The courting, you know, the letters and things like this to rekindle that love because you can fall in love again. You can fall in love again to have that proper relationship. Chapter 3. <clears throat> she says, By night on my bed I sought the one I loved. I sought him, but I did not find him. Now she's looking for him. Now, I'm trying to get a hold of this book, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to get it by next week. I was hoping to. Uh, it's a book that's written by Bob Probert, and it's on, on the Song of, Song of Solomons. And um, it's about the Jewish wedding. And this is the Jewish wedding that's taking place here. In the Jewish wedding, you have the, the bride with her bridesmaids waiting for the groom. You'll see this in the Ten Virgins that, that Jesus talks about with the lampstands waiting some were filled and some were not well the groom is away at his father's house and he's building a room for his new bride and when the room is done the father inspects it and then tells him go and get your bride and so in the jewish custom which lasts seven days um, he would then begin to come down and look for her well she's looking for him the whole time sending people out and so forth. Where's he at? Where's he at? He's not coming yet. I can't find him. I'm waiting here and so forth, preparing myself for my groom. So forth. And all of a sudden, screaming and yelling and shouting. And he's coming. He's coming. He's coming. And he comes and he snatches his bride. And he takes her home to the room. And they consum consummate the, the marriage. And the whole feast is going on. Well, that's a picture of Christ's return for the church. See, we're waiting for the Lord, right, to come. And we're looking for him. Where is he? Where is he? When is he going to come? And some of us are losing hope. Don't lose hope. He's coming. And one day the angels will shout. The trumpets will sound. And he's coming. He's coming. He's coming. And he will take us and he'll rapture us up. And we'll be in heaven with our groom for eternity. And the great feast will take place. So the Jewish wedding is a picture of Christ in the church. The wedding that will take place then. And so it's a beautiful picture. And I hope to get that book and, and give them out to you guys. If I get a good deal on them. But if not, maybe you will help pay for it, I hope. 
because it is a good book on the Jewish wedding. He goes on in verse 2, I will rise now, I said, and go about the city. In the streets and in the squares, I will seek the one I love. I sought him, but I did not find him. The watchmen who go about the city found me. I said, have you seen the one I love? So again, I mean, it's, it's not easy for her to leave the comfort, security of her bed for the dangers of the street, but love cannot rest until it finds its beloved. You know, that's the kind of love that we should have for our spouses. Scarcely had I passed by them when I found the one I love. I held him and would not let him go until I had brought him to the house of my mother and into the chambers of her who conceived me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the does of the field, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. Then she writes, Who is this coming out of the wilderness? Like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all the merchant fragrant powders. You almost picture Christ coming, you know, when the angel sound, the trumpet, and it's a great thing, and we hear it. I remember uh, several years ago, the, the space shuttle was coming into the atmosphere here. I, I can't remember where it was going to land, but somewhere in California. And I remember we were at the beach at the time, and we heard this big boom. It was just like a, in the air, just boom. And we didn't see anything like, what was that? And I thought, is that the trumpet? Is that like the first trumpet? Are we going to get ready to go here? You know, because I didn't see anything, and I thought maybe that was it. I was, and I was serious. And then later on down the day, I heard that uh, the space shuttle had broken into the atmosphere and it created this big boom. And that's what it was. It was that sound. So I can almost imagine the Lord doing that when he comes back and, and the trumpets, you know. And I think the trumpets that will sound, we will be the only ones that hear it, knowing that he's coming. And, and by the time we look up, we're gone in a twinkling of an eye, raptured into heaven. And so she describes that in such, he describes that in a beautiful way here in verse 6. Behold, it is Solomon's couch with 60 valiant men around it, and the valiant, the valiant of Israel. Now the couch here is, a better translation of Hebrew would be wedding chariot. We all have a chariot, right, at the wedding. Everyone's got to have a limo. They've got to have a nice little car to take the groom and the bride and usher them into the party of the church or whatever. And so even back then, he had a couch, a chariot with all valiant men around it, and they just used it as that uh, bridal car. And they all hold swords, being experts in war, every man has a sword on his thigh because of fear in the night. Of the wood of Lebanon, Solomon the king made himself a platitine. He made its pillars of silver, its support of gold, its seed of purple, its interior paved with love. By, it's always good to do things with love by the daughters of Jerusalem. Go forth, O daughter of Zion, and see King Solomon with the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, the day of the gladness of his heart. You know, the church is waiting for the Lord's glorious coming. But as we wait, we need to experience this great, his great love and great joy as we're waiting for his return. We don't, we don't see him. We don't hear him audibly. But we can have a great sense of joy and peace that he's there with us as we experience him. Another description of Christ in the church. Let's finish up in chapter 4. These chapters are, are pretty short, so. Now she says, or he says, as the marriage ceremony continues, Behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. You have dove eyes behind your veil. So the ceremony is going on. Your hair is like a flock of goats' hair going down from the Mount of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of Sean, Sean sheeps, which have come up from the washing, every one of which bears twins, and none is barren among them. Your teeth are like goat's teeth. If you look at goat's teeth, they're just sheared, you know, because they're always chewing, so they rub each other. In other words, they're perfectly white and straight in every way. Your lips are like the strands of scarlet, and your mouth is lovely. Um, your temples behind your veils are like, the, like a piece of pomegranate. Your neck is like the Tower of David. Now, I don't know what that means. If she had a long neck, 
you know, we have some tribes that put those rings and they stretch their necks out because they, they think long necks are beautiful. It could be that was the custom back then or, or maybe she just had a long neck and that was a, a beautiful part of, of that person. We all have our preferences, right? You know, uh, of our wives. You know, I know the, the perfect parts of my wife. I love, no, never mind. <laughs> I love her neck. It's nice and short. <laughs> and I love. So her neck is a Tower of David built <clears throat> for an armory. <laughs> this holds an armory uh, on which hangs a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. Um, your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle, which feed among the lilies. No comment. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee away, I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh and to the hills of frankincense. You are all fair, my love, and there is no spot in you. In other words, there's no blemish. You are, you are perfect. You're perfect. <clears throat> I, like waking, I like the fact that my wife sleeps late. She stays up late, sleeps late in. I get up early and go to bed early. Usually, sometimes I'm in bed at 8, 30, 9 o'clock and gone. But I wake up at 5.30 in the morning, sometimes 4 or 30 in the morning. But oftentimes I will just stand by her side of the bed and I just look at her while she's sleeping. And that's what Solomon is saying here. She says, "So beautiful. She's the most beautiful thing in the world." You know, and, and I just, I'll just gaze at her, and I'm just like, "Man, you, God has blessed me. You know, she's beautiful in, in my eyes. That's my wife." You know? And I just gaze at her for for a long time, and she doesn't even know it. You know? She doesn't even know it how much love that I have for her. It's the love that Christ has for the church. Isn't it interesting that Christ gazes upon you every single day, every second of the day? He's always looking on you. There, there's a picture in heaven where, where Satan comes to God and he's walking to and fro. And we know the story in Job and God says, have you thought of my servant Job? And of course Satan says, yeah, but you protect him. You protect him. And then you get to Revelation and it talks about Satan being a accuser of the brethren. And that he's always accusing us before God. So you can almost see, see Satan telling, look God, look what they're doing now. And God says, oh, they're covered by my, my son's blood. That's how he views us. Oh, they're righteous. Oh, they're already pure. They already sit in the heavenly places. And all because of my son's blood and what he did on the cross. And that's how he views us. He loves us beyond, beyond our understanding. Come with me to Lebanon, my spouse. Verse 8. With me from Lebanon, look from the top of Amana, from the top of Seir and Hermon, from the lion's den, from the mountains of the leopards. Um, important, come with me. Let me lead you. Let me guide you. We talked a little bit about this on Sunday. You know, uh, wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands. Um, I had someone not correct me, but give me a little input after the second service, they said that um, in their relationship that their husband was abusive and that I didn't mention that. And I says, you're right, I didn't. I did mention it in the first service, but I didn't in the second service. Um, and so I told her that this Sunday I'm going to be talking to the guys, and so I will talk to them, and I will talk about a little bit of uh, husbands that are uh, abusive and that that should not be tolerated at all. You know, that's something that you don't tolerate in fact, you separate, you know, and it's, it's to allow God to do his work in them. You know, this is why you separate until uh, they either come to know the Lord. And, of course, they come to the Lord by your submission to them, but not by your permission in allowing them to abuse you and so forth. So I put her at ease a little bit because she came from that type of relationship and she felt she was a, a submissive, submissive wife. And, I, and she separated. I says, I agree with you. No problem at all. I think that that needs to happen until God gets his heart. You know, and that happens from time to time. And it happens the other way too. Let me just say that. There are women that are abusive to their husbands, you know, that are always going out, you know, partying and doing things and, and so forth. As I mentioned, you know, busy bodies telling people about their husbands, talking around and, you know, things like that. It shouldn't be happening. It shouldn't be happening. That, that needs to stop. That's disrespectful. 
And so Solomon here is leading his wife. Come with me to the top of here. Come with me to Hermon. Come with me to the, to the mountains. And she's willing to follow because she's in love with him. You, you, verse 9, you have ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. Now that's two interesting uh, phrases, my sister, my spouse. Now Virginia is also my sister in the Lord. You know, I often tell her, and we talked about this earlier in our, in our walk when we read the scripture where it says that there's no longer marriage in heaven, and we looked at each other and said, oh no, and I told her, I'm going to miss you. I'm going to miss you so much when we get to heaven. Because you're going to be with Jesus, and I'm going to be with Jesus, and we're going to be married, and we're not going to be married anymore. You know? And then I thought, but at the same time, we're going to have perfect love. You know? And so we're probably going to love each other even more than we can even imagine, but we won't have the same type of relationship. We only have that now here. That's special, I think. And that's why we need to make it special, those of us that are married. We need to understand that. We only have maybe... 40, 50, 60 years of marriage, and then that's it, you're done. So can't we just get along? <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, I mean, make it the best that you can, because after that, it's done. So, my sister, my spouse, you have ravished my heart with one look of your eyes, with one link of your necklace, her long neck. How fair is your love, my sister, my spouse, how much better than the wine is your love and the scent of your perfume than all spices. Your lips, O oh my spouse, drip as the honeycomb. Honey and milk are under your tongue, and the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. Man, I wish I could talk like that. I'd really impress my wife. A garden enclosed in my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Your plants are an orchard of pomegranates, with pleasant fruits, fragrant henna and spikenard. Spikenard and soften, calamus, cinnamon, and all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloe with all its chief spices, a fountain of, of gardens, a well of living waters and streams from Lebanon. I mean, this is how you express your love, guys, to your wife. I mean, this, this is how you do it. So read it over again and come up with your own little poems. Awake, O north wind, and come, O south, blow upon my garden. Uh, now we know she's speaking intimacy with her husband here. They're married, they're consummating the, the relationship and so forth. And so they're talking about that. That its spices may flow out. Let my love, beloved come to his garden and eat its pleasant fruits. Intimacy is good. Uh, kids, plug your ears. Sometimes we have to say some things here. <laughs> uh, you know, when you find the right person, and that right person is through prayer and seeking God, for you younger ones that are, are in here, uh, don't rush it. You pray, you seek the Lord, you make sure they are the right woman, you make sure that they're the right man, you make sure that they love you, just like Solomon loved his wife, and, and just like she loved him. You make sure of all those things, and don't, make, don't, don't just let it be an emotional thing, make sure they love the Lord, make sure they know the scriptures, make sure that, that they're on fire for God. And when you find that person, you will have an intimacy that will blow you away. An intimacy in your relationship with, that only you and your wife can have that no one else has. And it's blessed and sanctioned by the Lord. As Hebrews 13 tells us that the bed is undefiled before God. And it's something to be enjoyed with your spouse. And so enjoy that and don't feel guilt from it. But glorify God through it. Because your relationship with your spouse reflects Christ and the church.